Oh, hey, it's the announcement guy. I'm over here at the latte cart. We've been off duty for a while, but we're back this Sunday. All the proceeds from the latte cart go to support youth activities here at Mile High Church. So stop by, meet a teenager, have yourself a great cup of coffee. Here's what's coming up. We're getting ready for another great Sunday here at Mile High Church, and I want to invite you to check out our health and well-being initiative online. Check out all the things that you can do to improve your health and well-being in 2022. And as a part of that initiative, I'm beginning a class March 15th, Tuesday nights called Love Forward. It's all about stopping loving backwards in our lives and learning to love forward using that creative power of love to improve all of our relationships. And when you register, know that you can bring someone else to the class for free. Transcending Trauma is a class for women who have experienced trauma and are ready to take their next step along their healing journey. In this class, we will learn how trauma can impact one's life and how we can move from a space of simply surviving to thriving. So join me for four weeks as we learn, grow, and transform together. Class begins Thursday, March 17th. I'll see you there. Oh, I am back cleaning up here at the latte cart. Next week is daylight savings time, so we'll be springing forward. Nothing says springing forward and missing an hour of sleep like stopping for a good cup of coffee. Have a great week.
the Mile High Choir and their director, Stacy Landis. <laughs> we haven't had them here since Christmas time. Isn't it great to have them back again? Wow. Whew. Wonderful joy. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Stacy, for bringing us such beautiful music today. Welcome, all of you hardy Colorado residents. If you're watching online and you're not local this morning, it's a snowy morning out there, but we all made it here safely and soundly into this warm, beautiful sanctuary, and we're so glad you're here, and I want to acknowledge something. I want to wish my wonderful colleague, Reverend Josh Reeves, and our entire community a happy anniversary. Friday was three years ago since Reverend Josh and I became your senior lead minister, so three years! Yay! Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a joy and a challenge, boy. <laughs> Not because of you or anything that's going on here, but because of this pandemic that's been going on. And what has touched me so much is despite all of that, we remain strongly anchored in community, strongly anchored in the willingness to stand with each other through all that goes on and lift each other up by uh, participation and giving and all that we do in this community. You're, you make a difference, and we thank you for bringing your light to this community and then taking it out into the world. What a blessing that is. Thank you. Happy anniversary. Yes. And we're going to uh, take a moment to also become really present to the vision and mission that is Mile High Church, to take a moment to speak it out loud together as an affirmation and a reminder of who we are and what we stand for as a community. So I invite you to join me as we first read our vision, Oneness Revealed, a world of love, peace, and abundance for all. And our mission, to serve as a spiritual beacon for personal empowerment and global enlightenment. What a joy it is to remember these things and to take them now into a time of quietude and prayer. We're going to sing together a beloved song that for many people is the anchoring moment of the whole service to remind ourselves that spirits in this place, not only here in this community, but right here, it's right here right now, to have a few moments of silence and then beloved Dr. Barry will lead us in a beautiful prayer. We invite you to sit back, relax, let us begin. I can hear the brush of angel wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of God is in this place. Surely the presence of God is in this place. I can feel the mighty power and the grace. I can hear the brush of angel wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of God is in this. So in this sacred moment, we acknowledge that the presence of the living spirit 
is indeed in this place and alive in each one of us right now. We open to that. I know that there is a divine wisdom, divine creativity, a divine love that is alive right now everywhere in the world and seeks to express itself through us. So we open to that. From that place of connection, I speak my word and offer this prayer for the people of Ukraine right now. May they feel the presence of this divine spirit right where they are. May they be protected. May they know that they are loved. And may peace break out. May peace break out in that part of the world and in all parts of the world. I give thanks for this beloved community right here in Mile High Church for the ways that we serve in the world, for the contributions that we make. I give thanks for each person here today, each person online. It's so important that we know that our prayers, that our thoughts, that our lives make a difference in bringing peace into the world. I give thanks for Dr. Michelle and her message this morning about living this truth, making it real in our lives. I give thanks for this day, for this moment, for the blessings that we feel right now. And so it is. Amen. Blessed always Blessed always for the arms of God surround us. Let our joy be so triumphant that we rest in God and say. of inspiration this morning come from Paramahansa Yogananda. Belief in God and faith in God are different. A belief is valueless if you don't test it and live by it. Belief converted into experience becomes faith. From Marianne Williamson, we were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it's in everyone. From our founder, Ernest Holmes. Here and now, we are surrounded by and immersed in an infinite good. How much of this infinite good is ours? All of it. And how much of it may we have to use? As much of it as we can embody. Sick and tired of being sick and tired. Had as much of you as I can take I'm so done, so over 
being afraid I've gone through the motions I've been back and forth I know what you're thinking Your heart is here for I don't know how to say it So I'm just gonna say it Yeah Fear you don't own me There ain't no room in this story And I ain't got time for you Telling me what I'm not Like you know me Well guess what I know Let it settle in You probably never saw it coming Something's gotta give So I give up you Whoa, whoa, whoa There's no room for you here Yeah, I've had enough The no vacancy sign on my heart is lit up In case you didn't hear it Here it is again Whoa, fear you don't Anybody out there just like me? Anybody needing fear to leave? If you don't know how to say it, sing along with me. Sing fear you don't own me. There ain't no room in this story. And I ain't got time for you telling me what I'm not like you know me. Well, guess what? I know who I am. Jennifer Burnett, Woo! and our wonderful band, Kent, and Rob, and Mike, and Bijou, so talented. Thank you very much. Wow. Uh, fear you don't own me. I love that. And it's perfect today for what I want to invite us to explore today. My uh, topic is from believing to embodying. And it's born out of uh, this notion of how we actually change and even transform our lives and our experience. Our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, talks about three portals, I think, into transformation. Whose gloves are those? Wow, okay, they're di very distracting, aren't they? No, it's all right, you can keep them there, Jeanette, it's all right. Okay, back to the talk now. Yeah. <laughs> Those three portals are thinking, believing, embodying. We use them all somewhat interchangeably. We use them all in different ways. And I want to go through them one at a time because I believe in my heart that each one of them, while being a portal to transformation, when we, when we want to go to the deepest place possible to really be a, a being that contributes to the transformation of life on planet Earth, or we want to be a being of transformation in our own experience around something, that it, it is far superior 
to explore the deep level of embodiment. And here's what I mean by this. Ernest Holmes is famous for saying, change your thinking, change your life. We, we say it a lot around here. And uh, I, I thought it was funny uh, that an apartment renting company uh, took that saying and said, uh, change your apartment, change your life. <laughs> kind of silly, but probably true to some extent. But here's the thing. When we first, as human beings, think about changing our thinking, changing our life, where we tend to go is in that place within our mind that is commonly called the more conscious aspect of our mind, which is about 10% of the use of our brain, actually. The part of us that thinks we know what we think. Actually thinks we know what we think. We forget that we think we know what we think, but then things look really different around us. And we can know that, that our thinking might be a little bit askew, that maybe uh, what we think isn't in alignment with the co-creative process that's happening through us. If what's happening in our lives, we look at, and I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but I certainly have of, I don't remember thinking that. I don't remember at all thinking about that. How did that happen? And it's because we tend to categorize changing our thinking with just what we think we know we actually think in that conscious realm. And we deepen our ability to use the transformational principles of life when we understand that there's a deeper level of thinking that's happening, the deeper unconscious level that's happening, the place at the deepest aspect of us, which brain scientists say we humans currently use it about, uh, that's about 80% of, 80 to 85% of our thinking are those deeper beliefs that have been born out of our childhood experiences, uh, the, the things that have happened that have been great that we've chosen to create deep-seated beliefs about, the things that have happened that aren't so great that we've chosen to create deep-seated beliefs about, that that thinking is really the creative source and force of our life, the combination of the, the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. But where a lot of us want to go when we first encounter this teaching is just at that surface level. And we aren't always very successful at making change at that level because we don't dive into the deeper aspects of ourselves. And that's a huge part of what our classes and workshops and the work we do with practitioners is all about here in our community is, is revealing to ourselves some of those deeper truths that we haven't even maybe allowed to come to the surface for us to see. But we know, if we've been studying this teaching, that when Holmes says thinking, he means that all-encompassing aspect of mind. But at first glance, it just doesn't seem like it's deep enough to truly change our experience by just encountering the surface mind. So then we become interested, possibly, in going a little deeper. And that's where we start to uh, dance with the word of change your belief, change your mind. So if I'm going to edit our founder. <laughs> no lightning came or anything like that, so I think it's okay, right? I would possibly suggest that we look at change our believing, change our life. Believing then can encompass what we passionately believe or what we have come to believe by our experience in life. And we quote the great teacher, the master teacher Jesus often around here, who said, as ye believe, it is done unto you. And so we, we work a lot to explore our beliefs and our belief systems, which we can then incorporate some of that deeper mind. But what's happening to our life and to our world as I see it is that we are definitely deepening our passions in what we believe. And while that's not altogether a bad thing or a wrong thing, sometimes that doorway, just like the doorway of thinking might only take us into the surface level of our life, the doorway of our beliefs can take us sometimes into beliefs that we are passionate 
and fervent about and even attached and righteous about. We can get really caught up and I believe this. I believe this is true. And sometimes in utilizing that creative process that's flowing through us, what I've noticed is that I'm far more successful in making positive and powerful changes when I land in a place of passion about some direction I want to go with my believing that also allows for the grace of the divine to have its way through me. Because I'm understanding that I of myself create nothing. See, what happens when we start to get into this dancing with belief systems is we start to think that we, the ego me, is the creative force. And that I'm in control of what's being created. But the reality is that Holmes says that nothing can happen to us that doesn't happen through us. And so the secret to creating a new life is to creating a bigger belief about ourselves and about life. But we get caught because our beliefs sometimes fall into this place where they're small they're filled with attachment. In other words, rather than I'm believing in the good that I'm seeking and I'm open and allowing the grace and the creative source to flow through me and I'm in partnership with the divine, we go to, I believe I want that and I want it right now. Nothing and other than that will do. And we get very attached. If it doesn't turn out that way, then it's wrong. If it doesn't turn out the way I say, then, well, I'm going to question this teaching. If it isn't the way I think it should be, then something is wrong. And that becomes a trap for the ego. It's, a, it's attachment, which Buddhism talks about causes suffering. And the reason it causes suffering it, is because it's born out of fear. And it's not, it's not in alignment with who and what we really are at the core. And so we get caught up, we get caught up, and we get stuck, and our believing only goes so far, and it becomes a close-mindedness, and it even can go into a, a bit of righteousness at some times. And we see a lot of that is causing huge conflict for us in our world right now, this righteous sense that we're going from passionate stands of co-creation to righteousness about the way I see things is the only way that's correct. And I'm going to just hold on to this with all my guts until life proves that I'm right. And all the while, we've shut ourselves out from the creative flow of the divine. I'm sure we all know people who are righteous like that, who have righteous beliefs in their moral fortitude or righteous beliefs about parenting or righteous beliefs about food and diet and exercise and righteous beliefs about uh, everything, including philosophy and the two big ones, right? Righteousness about religion and politics. Righteousness. My belief is right. And hoping to create change and transformation from that place will always feel like walking in, in quicksand because it's not our true nature. And it's not making the right use of the divine presence through us and as us. So for example... I am blessed that I found this beautiful church and teaching when I was a teenager, that my mother and I came into this teaching, I think I was about 15 years old, and I felt like this was my spiritual home. This is where I belong. And I began to learn about the community and participate and volunteer and do all of that I do, became a practitioner, worked here at the church, became a minister. I am a passionate, practicing, religious scientist. I believe in these teachings. They work for me. Now, I also know that when it comes to faith, religion, for example, people can get kind of fundamental about their faith. Have you noticed that? I've noticed that. 
And we sometimes want to think, well, it's people out there, the other faiths that do that. What I have learned over the years is that there are fundamentalist Christians and there are more mystical cosmic Christians. There are the fundamentalist practitioners of Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, and the more mystical Kabbalists. There are the more uh, fundamentalist new thought tradition. Yes, yep, religious, fundamental religious scientists. They do exist. It's not an urban myth. They, they do exist. People who take this teaching and will pound us over the head with it, right? Versus the more mystical and inclusive. And as a teenager, there were two things that really struck me about this teaching that made it that I wanted to participate. Number one, there was an absolute acceptance that all faiths have something beautiful and amazing about them. That I could stand firmly in practicing this teaching and also bless and love all beings everywhere. That I did not have to go out and recruit or believe that the world will only be right if everyone is practicing this teaching. And I put my arms like this because it's kind of that closed stand. You know, if everybody would just do this, the world would be better. I don't believe that. For one minute, I don't. I believe that every faith has something to give to the world. My belief is that every heart and every soul should find the faith tradition that most serves them. And that we at, here at Mile High Church tend to, to be more on the mystical side of the tradition that we teach and believe that all faiths have something to teach us, which is demonstrated by how we live out and practice this faith, how we have that, have you seen that beautiful uh, case over there as you go down the hallway to the restroom? It's now filled with all sorts of dedications to other faith traditions, the celebrating of other faiths in the world, the acknowledgement of that, and the willingness to be open at the top, as our founder talked about. To me, that is the most powerful, loving place on, on the planet. And moreover, I believe that whatever it is that created this universe, God, spirit, infinite intelligence, how, whatever his or her name is, that that's how it sees it. That there's not a God out there that's going, there's only one way to me. There are many paths that lead to the divine. And my believing that my path is the one and only right way is not only not in alignment with the true nature of the universe, it shuts me down. It makes me small. It makes my access and my awareness of my true spiritual nature not as available. Whereas my openness to say, this is what I believe, this is where I stand, and I welcome all faiths, all thoughts, all ideas. And I'm allowing for that. Now imagine if we could practice that in all those other realms and even more. In our, the ways that we live our life, in our religion and in our faith, in our parenting, in our, the way we are with our body temple, the way we are in the world. Because the reality is that that kind of closed righteousness, it's destructive to ourselves and others. And we're seeing it playing out with leaders of the world, especially right now. Now, I don't know Vladimir Putin personally, but I suspect that part of what's motivating him is a closed-minded righteousness. And it's a path of destruction for himself and others. It doesn't work. It doesn't belong here in the kingdom of heaven, does it? And so while we look out and we may feel afraid or angry at him, it also is an invitation for all of us to look at ourselves. To say that if I want to be a part of changing the world for myself and others, I can't be that righteous about anything. I've got to allow my faith to be expanded. And what I know about this tradition is while it's right for me and I love it, I know that there may come a time where I choose to step away from it and do something different. There may come a time when I step across the earth plane into the next existence and learn that everything that we believe here wasn't exactly right. 
I loved in the book Illusions by Richard Bach, all these beautiful ideas, and the very last words he says is, everything in this book may be wrong. <laughs> and I feel that we can stand passionately in what we believe and at the same time allow our faith to be open and questioning and even nurture the moments where we doubt and we're concerned and we're not sure because we know that this evolves us and deepens us and lets us be in touch with the infinite grace of life that we're always seeking to, de seeking to deepen into. There's a wonderful um, woman named Leslie Hazelton. She's a British American author. And her work focuses on the intersection and interactions between politics and religion. And she has a lot to say about this. And here's something she said that I've really been resonating with. She said, abolish all doubt. And what's left is not faith, but absolute heartless conviction. You're certain that you possess the truth, and this certainty quickly devolves into dogmatism and righteousness, by which I mean a demonstrative overweening of pride in being so very right. In short, the arrogance of fundamentalism. Like fundamentalists of all religious stripes, they have no questions, only answers. They found the perfect antidote to thought and the ideal refuge from the hard demands of real faith. This isn't faith, it's fanaticism. And we have to stop confusing the two. We have to recognize that real faith has no easy answers. It's difficult and stubborn. It involves an ongoing struggle, a continual questioning of what we think we know a wrestling with issues and ideas, it goes hand in hand with doubt in a never-ending conversation with it and sometimes in conscious de defiance of it. And so I say that sometimes the doorway of belief takes us down a path of attachment and fear and fundamentalism about things that doesn't serve us in the long run that we can stand passionately for what we believe while allowing all others to stand in their own belief and be an expression of the divine, which then leads to further editing of our phrase, change what you embody, change your life. Embodiment is about a deeper walk in the divine. Embodiment is about expression and identity it's a deeper awareness of the true nature of who we are, transcendent of what we think is true and what we think we believe. Embodiment, when we live in it and we surrender into it, invites us into an awakening about our beliefs that allow us to claim and proclaim a deeper walk with the divine. The dissonance between what we believe and what we embody shows itself to us by what we're righteous about or afraid of. It shows itself to us by what we say we believe but what's actually happening in our life. It shows us to us about what we say we believe and how we actually behave. And it shows itself to us by what we say we believe and what patterns actually repeat themselves in our experience. We get what we are, not what we want. We get what we are, not what we want. So it seems to me that in this, this opportunity and this desire that we have to shift and change our lives individually and collectively, we are more powerful if we begin to explore embodiment. What am I embodying and how can I be a greater embodiment of the living presence of the divine so that whatever I do, however I participate in life, I truly am doing it from the most powerful place. So I have three ways to live out embodiment today. The first one is in our prayers. I call them embodiment prayers. We have a beautiful way of praying here in our teaching. Spiritual mind treatment. 
And when people first start to learn it, it's so radically different than other ways that people pray that it can be very heady. We're worried about the words and we're worried about getting the steps right and all that, which is fine as we're learning something. But what we find as we deepen into it and we begin to embody its nature and embody the intention of it is that we find that a deepening happens within us. At first, when we hear about transformative prayer, we might get caught up in the surface realm of the surface mind of what we'd like to be different. And this is where we get criticized as a tradition a lot of times because people think we're only interested in, they call it princes, palaces, and parking spots. (laughs) That that's what we're about. I'm going to pray for the perfect parking spot. Now that's not a horrible thing to do, not necessarily. But if that's all we're doing is praying for parking spots and princes and princesses and our house and all that, we're missing the deeper transformative opportunity of the living presence as prayer. And so there's this opportunity to to go beyond the surface mind that thinks it knows what should be happening and, and have a deeper experience. For example, in our health initiative, which I love our health and well-being initiative this year, It's one thing to say, I'm going to pray for this condition in my life to do better self-care, to take better care of my body, to get more sleep, to do the things I know in my surface mind would really help me be healthier. That's fine. That's good. And a deeper embodiment of the health and wellness initiative would be to see and embody myself as a living presence of divine health as God sees me, while I'm doing that other stuff. My suggestion is if all I ever do is treat at the surface level for a change of behavior, I might be successful, but I might have to repeat. I might have to go back and deal with that illness again. I might have to lose those five pounds all over again. Because all I did was dance in the realm of the surface of what I wanted to have happen from my ego state of mind versus that deeper embodiment that says, I am the health that God is. I am divine health. And so our prayers about ourselves go from a place of embodiment of a a quality of being. I can tell you right now in my own life, I very rarely ever pray for something out there to happen anymore. My prayers are all about, I choose to be this, to express God as me, as love, as light in that relationship, in that challenge I'm facing, in that situation. And my prayers feel deeper and richer. And so we can transform and deepen our experience. And then add to that embodiment imagination. And we've got a beautiful recipe for true change and transformation at the deepest level. By this I mean using our imagination to see that which we are choosing to embrace. Who am I? How do I walk through my world if I am the living embodiment of health? And that's a powerful way to see ourselves. And there are a couple of key ways to see and use our imagination. In the realm of brain science and the study of imagery and imagination, they've come up with two distinct methods that we can do this. One is the first person, which is associative, and the other is the third person, which they call disassociative. And here's the example of how that works. If you want to join me for this, you can close your eyes or you can have your eyes open. I invite us to imagine a beach somewhere. You can, you can imagine any beach you want. Especially on this winter day, isn't it nice to imagine a beach? And, and the wa- waves are crashing in and there's sand and maybe there's people on the beach or maybe your beach is a quiet beach with nobody around. But just imagine, see yourself looking down on the beach and then imagine seeing yourself on the beach someplace. Maybe you're in the water or you're walking along or you're sitting in the sand or on a bench or on a towel someplace and see yourself on the beach. This is third person disassociative imagining. It's great, it's wonderful. But now, see yourself scooting down in your mind's eye and suddenly being in your body on the beach, wherever you are, in the water, 
Feel the warmth of the sun. Hear the sounds that are there. Being in the body is first person associative. And scientists say that this is actually a far more superior way to use our imagination. You can take a deep breath and come back. And the reason that this is far more superior, according to them, is that the brain doesn't know the difference when we imagine like this. So when we are choosing to pray about something, to embody it and imagine it as so, not just say the words, but to imagine it with the full experience of our sensorial ability to see it, to feel it, to hear it, to smell it, to taste it, to imagine it, to have that full experience anchors it more completely within us. It's using our imagination in this powerful way. And then the last one is to embrace the embodiment of the divine. To recognize that I'm not just a place where God is, that the experience and expression of the creative source and force is fully right here, right now, in me, as me, through me, around me. In his book, The Science of Mind, which we commonly call the textbook, Ernst Holmes has a chapter where he's talking about the power of thought. And I love how he describes this sense of being the embodiment of the living presence. He says, imagine the universe as as though it's all water. Nothing but water permeating the, permeated by an infinite intelligence. And imagine that every time this intelligence moves or thinks, ice forms to the core, exactly to the corresponding thought. And we might have in this, in this scenario, countless pieces of ice in various colors, shapes, and forms, but it would still be water, wouldn't it? Still be H2O. If we could heat the entire mass, it would melt, and all forms would then become again water, yet nothing would have changed about it but form. He says, the physical universe is spirit in form. That includes me, that includes you. And when we choose to live a life of embodiment of our divine nature, we begin to contribute to our own well-being and to the well-being of life on this planet in a powerful and profound way. What is it like to do this? I know I'm still working on it, but lately I find great peace and well-being when I see the challenges going on in my life or in the world to imagine walking through those situations, not just that God is there, but that God through me and as everyone involved is there, is expressing there. A few nights ago, like many of you, I was watching the news with my husband kind of late at night. I was watching what's going on in Ukraine and feeling sad and helpless, hopeless, not knowing what to do. We've got sunflowers on our altar today in solidarity with our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. And even our Russian brothers and sisters whose leader is doing what he's doing. And I felt myself say, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to make a difference here. And that inner voice said, pray. And not only that, it said to me, you will not create peace on earth in this situation by continuing to fall into fear. Like Jennifer's song, Fear You Don't Own Me. It said to me, the only way out of this is through the God presence. 
And so I began to pray. And as I prayed, what I did is I said, okay, I'm working on this talk about being the embodiment of the divine. How do I do that? And all of a sudden, I felt the light just filling every aspect of myself, every cell filled with light, my thoughts filled with light, and I felt it like pouring out of me. It was almost like that, it was kind of an icky scene, but in the, the, uh, the, the yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? The movie with Harrison Ford, the, yeah, yeah. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, right? The, great, the Raiders of the Great Last Land, yeah, that's the one, Jeanette. If Jeanette wasn't here, I could never get a talk right. You know, I'm so grateful. She's always there to help me. <laughs> but it was kind of like that. I felt this light just kind of pouring out through me and, and going over the whole world. And then it also went not only to the people of Ukraine and of Russia, it also touched Putin himself. And it said to me, what if those of us who are seeking to be the living embodiment of the light. Just send our light there like crazy. Just sending our light around our earth, comforting anyone who's afraid, comforting anyone who's... Now, some of us are arguing, that's not enough. We need to do something. But I would say that being that living embodiment of the divine then also guides me in every area of the life I'm living and the life we share about what might be mine to do in the world. And for me, that night, mine was to go to bed and be the living embodiment of God. And in that, feel the peace and the light and the love and the well-being that God is as a transformative power. That that is my fervent sense of the divine and it's time to use it and be it and continue this holy, sacred work each one of us is here to do. And I align with that voice. We won't create peace in our lifetime, in our life, by continuing to be afraid. Our work is bigger than that. It's calling us to a greater realm than that. And as I read through our founder's meditations, I found this meditation that I would like to close with today. It's up on the screen. If you want to read along with me, feel free. The power within me is God, and it must bless and help and heal all who come near it. Silently, the work goes on, and silently, all are being helped by this inner power which is operating through me. I give thanks that my power within is silently blessing all and helping everyone to whom my thought reaches. And I invite our practitioner prayer partners to stand with me now as we pray together. I know and accept and affirm that this living embodiment of the divine presence is the true nature of each one of us. That we are an embodiment prayer right now. As we accept and affirm ourselves as this presence, this light, this love, activated in our own living and activated on behalf of all beings on this planet. We choose now to be it, to live it, to surrender into it, to change what we embody and therefore change our living profoundly and powerfully. I accept that this presence is health and wholeness and wellness and light and love and peace and abundance on behalf of myself and every person who hears this prayer and indeed every being everywhere. I give thanks and bless all and send light. Send light to anywhere that I am called to send it. Send love, send peace, accept, affirm, knowing this truth. It is so. I release this prayer into that law that makes it so in faith and trust that as it has been spoken, it is done. And so it is. Amen. You are beautiful. 
true and divine You are beautiful, true and divine When I look in your eyes I see you shine You are beautiful, true and divine Can you see the beauty you are Blazing like a shining star If only you could see what I see The perfection of your divinity And I see it in everything you do I see it in you I see it in you Are beautiful, true and divine You are beautiful True and divine When I look in your eyes I see you shine You are beautiful True and divine You are beautiful True and divine I appreciate that you saying that to us, Jennifer, but I personally think you are beautiful, true, and divine. <laughs> I have such good news. We've done a couple of really special projects recently, and we want to share how they've turned out. We had a fundraising effort that was for the Marshall Fires, and we raised $10,000 for the Marshall Fire Relief Fund. Thank you so much for your generosity. We also had a uh, sock and toilet paper drive here, and we had 3,100 rolls of toilet paper and 1,160 pair of socks donated. Was, isn't that wonderful? Thank you, thank you for your generosity, for always being willing to be of help and support to people in our world, and we so appreciate it. It, it, it allows us to claim and to stand in that beautiful flow of abundance. And so as we do that now, we're going to share through offerings and ties. Our ushers are going to pass baskets. For those of you in the room, we also have baskets in the lobby if you'd prefer that. You can, whether you're in the room or you're watching online, you can text to give, you can give through our website, you can send in a check to our address. All that's available on the screen. And let's affirm our abundance by saying together, divine love as me blesses and multiplies all I am, all I have, and all that I circulate. And so it is.
Wow, wow, wow. Jennifer Burnett, my high choir, my high right there. Yay! That wasn't bad. That wasn't bad at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Your talk wasn't bad either. Oh, thank you. you thank you, Barry. <laughs> thank you. So oh, good. The Look, time. there's a delivery man here. Oh, this is beautiful. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of Thanks. people are saying right mm -hmm. now, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, this is a great service and anything, but where can a person get a decent cup of coffee? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And I know the feeling, and our latte cart is reopened. Ah. You know, the choir is back, the latte yeah. cart is open. Life is good, isn't it? Yeah. Life is good. And I got a new so, pair of gloves, too, right there. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Thanks for just showing up. So uh, if you're here for the first time, congratulations. We're glad you're here. Hope you come back many times. We have a um, visitor center out in our lobby where the folks can answer any questions for you. And there's information about our uh, beautiful spiritual community and about our teaching. So. I'm glad you joined us today. If you're joining us online for the first time, find out more about us and come back. And also, if you're here in the room, our practitioners are up front. We're so glad that they're here. Yeah. Yay! Thank you. And they will help you with the body, uh, the living spirit that is already alive in you. So uh, thank you for being here. Take it over. All right. So we want you to know that throughout the week here at My High Church, we have opportunities for spiritual practice for you to come back onto our campus and experience chapel meditation. You can come and sit quietly, meditate in prayer. Tai Chi and Qigong. Let me drink some more coffee then I can get that right. Uh, yoga and you can walk the labyrinth anytime. The times are listed there and you can find it on the website. This Wednesday night, Reverend Michelle Scavetta will be speaking for us right here at 7 p.m. She's starting a new two-week series and we hope you'll come back and join us for that. And now if you will stand and we'll do a, a benediction and sing the peace song. We go forth in love and light, the living embodiment of the divine, knowing it, being it, living it right here and right now. Thank you, life. And so it is.